or we can all pinpoint things that, like could have been done differently or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we're not robots. We're, we're imperfect people raising imperfect people. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. I first encountered Bryce Reddy after I had just bought a new bra for the first time in 10 years. Someone shared Bryce's graphic entitled, Things Moms Put Off Doing for Themselves, including things like scheduling their own medical and dental visits, having fun with friends, and yes, updating their bras and underwear. I laughed out loud because of how inordinately proud I was of myself for buying those new bras. This woman gets me. And spoiler alert, I'm betting she gets you too. Since that day, I've followed Bryce on Instagram at mombrain.therapist, and her graphics are a window to my soul with subtle humor and endless compassion. So of course, I wanted to have her on the podcast, and of course, it turned out to be one of the most quotable interviews I've ever done, covering a range of topics from mom guilt to judgment to being gentle with ourselves. It was so hard to pick just one soundbite for the intro. You'll see what I mean. Bryce Reddy is a family therapist specializing in maternal mental health. She's also a mother herself with three children ages 8, 5, and 7 months, though her baby was just three months old at the time of this interview. I'll let Bryce tell you a little bit more about her path to specializing in maternal mental health. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. I'm in Massachusetts. So I just, you know, I worked since college, I worked in kind of the the helping fields, right? You know, I worked in um, youth outreach and, you know, I did a lot of work with the, the juvenile justice system. So I was heavily involved with that. And then I ended up going back to graduate school and I worked a lot in the um, substance abuse addiction recovery field. And through that, I worked with a lot of families because I live in an area that was really heavily impacted by the opioid epidemic. So working with families in that regard, you know, in terms of kind of the generational trauma that that was coming with and parent kids losing parents and being raised by grandparents. And I was working with a lot of families and, um, you know, I started getting interested in, you know, maternal mental health as I became a mother and dealt with my own issues, kind of coming into motherhood with postpartum depression and just kind of struggling with that transition. And so it's all kind of evolved through that, you know, I was working with families, working with kids, and then I became interested in working with parents and kind of here I am, (laughs) you know, I really started to focus working more with the parent side of it and how the transition to motherhood is impacting, you know, moms. With that background, I thought Bryce would be the perfect person to talk to for my episode about mom guilt, which was episode 88 if you missed it. So that's where our interview started. I want to know how how you define guilt and if there's a difference between regular old guilt and mom guilt. Hmm, I don't know. That's a really good question. So, you know, I think of mom guilt is just this kind of feeling we have that we're either like doing something wrong, we're messing up our kids or we're falling short in some way. And I think it's pretty closely related to, you know, just regular old guilt, but it just feels so much more strongly in motherhood, I think, because we take this job so seriously. We don't want to mess it up. And when we feel really strongly about something or really passionate about something, that's when that guilt can kind of, kind of, come in and take grip, right? Because we take this job seriously. We want to do a good job and we start, you know, micromanaging or, you know, analyzing every little thing, every little choice that we're making and putting a lot of weight on that in terms of like what it might mean, what its outcome is. Well, and maybe it's just because, you know, if you're, if there is such a thing as regular old guilt, I don't don't know, but that's, that's usually about us about how we feel, but maybe when there's another life in there, may, a, a mm-hmm. child in there, that, that may be why it compounds it maybe. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, there is so much in terms of parenting education out there right now. And this kind of constant, um, kind of information about how every single thing we do is impacting our kids in a lot of ways. You know, I think that we're seeing it a little bit more, you know, or I'm at least hearing about it a little bit more from parents. You know, I think years ago, parents just like, they raised their kids and that was it, you know, like they weren't really kind of like trying to look 50 years or 40 years down the line and thinking like, how is every action we make impacting, you know, this little human that we're responsible for. And maybe that they should have been, or I don't know, but like that, 
but today on, you know, we scroll social media and we're constantly seeing all of this kind of reparenting information. And we're seeing all of this information about how to parent in the best ways. And I think that we're kind of internalizing a lot of that and thinking that every little action that we do is having this long-term impact. And that can bring a lot of like anxiety, I think, onto us and, you know, exacerbate some of the guilt that we might naturally feel on its own. You know, I think that there is this obsession almost with not wanting to kind of recreate our past or recreate what was done to us, so to speak. Um, And, you know, how that is playing out in terms of like, you know, this next generational shift, right? You know, that there is, our kids are always going to have complaints about how we raise them. (laughs) You know, I mean, there's no, no matter how wonderful we think we are, how wonderful our parents were, we can all pinpoint things like, could have been done differently or whatever, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we're being, we're not robots. We're raising, we're imperfect people raising imperfect people, you know, and that there's going to constantly be kind of mistakes and errors and, you know, things we could have done differently or better with hindsight, you know, a little bit of perspective in terms of like raising multiple children, right. That you kind of gain some perspective as you go along and, um, there's just something to, you know, be said about that, that there is always going to be some imperfections in how we raise our kids. And 50 years from now, there's going to probably going to be a whole bunch of new parenting philosophies that differ from what we're being told today. So yeah, it's always going to be the case that the generation before, even, even as a whole culture did things wrong. Like <laughs> we, yeah. we're, we're no right. longer having our kids go out and cut us a switch so that we can beat them, you know? <laughs> Right. Positive change. Right. right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, there's always going to be an evolution as there should be. Right. So putting too much weight, I think on, you know, we can all just do our best with what we have and the information we have in the moment and with our circumstances. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, choice is a privilege to, in how we, you know, raise our kids or how we choose if, whether we go back to work and work or, you know, um, you know, whether we send our kids to certain daycares that one costs more money, one costs less money, you know, we're always making choices. And, you know, we're, we don't always have the breadth of choices that we might like. Yeah. So one thing I've been examining is kind of the types of the types of guilt. And in a broad sense, they kind of fall into two categories, either omission or commission, right? Like you're guilty for mm-hmm. what you did or you're guilty for what you didn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was just wondering if um, when you're like, when you're dealing, when you're talking to your clients, what are some of the things that if they're struggling with mom guilt, what are they feeling guilty about? I think it's more of an omission thing. You know, now that you say that, you know, people feeling like, oh, I should have, you know, um, fed my baby this certain way so they wouldn't be a picky eater, you know, that kind of um, hindsight thing. Or I should have played more, or I wish I did more fun things with my kids, but I'm just so burnt out. And, you know, that there is this kind of wishing that we kind of did the things that we think we're supposed to be doing that quote unquote supposed to, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say overcomplicating it, but kind of assigning ourselves these jobs in retrospect that we didn't follow through on and feeling guilty about that. And I think that's probably what I hear about the most, both in kind of the work I do with parents in person and both, you know, what I hear and see in terms of, um, you know, my Instagram community and the online work I do. And isn't that interesting in light of what we've been talking about too, because part of it, especially if you're retrospectively feeling guilt, part of it can be just that you know more now and and it's just the natural part of the learning process that you don't know a lot at the beginning like you can't Mm -hmm. you can't know exactly what you should do from the beginning but I mean there's you could also look at it as like oh I'm grateful I know this now instead of oh I wish I had been smarter then you know (laughs) Yeah, there's that reframe, right? That can kind of help us be a little bit gentler with ourselves. It doesn't always have to be, you know, being hard on ourselves, which kind of is like a natural inclination to like kind of shame ourselves and be like, oh, you should have done that. You're just the worst. But 
being that gentle voice and redirecting that, you know, kind of harsher inner critic that we all have into more of that gentle, you know, understanding way of saying like, you just didn't know. And like, you couldn't tell the future, right? That's just not possible. And you're doing your best you can now. You did your best then, you do your best now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's also like a matter of you, we have limited resources and time also, like it is impossible Mm -hmm. to, to do everything for every child, you know, like, unless you have can clone yourself and have three of you, Mm -hmm. it just isn't possible to do everything. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, Is this something that you have struggled with personally? Have you, have you felt mom guilt? And when you do feel that, how do you help yourself reframe? I can't, I'm pretty gentle on myself. You know, I think, and obviously I think that comes with a lot of practice. I mean, it's very easy to be like, oh, I don't do any of those things, but like, I've also talked through this, you know, process with hundreds of people. So I have a lot of practice in kind of redirecting those thoughts that can kind of consume us, but I'm also human. So like anybody else, there are times when, you know, I think my mom guilt can flare up and those are times like when I'm tired or I'm not feeling well, or, you know, I'm really kind of, um, I have a newborn right now, or I don't know if he's still considered a newborn, he's three months old, but, you know, I think when you're kind of in the thick of something new, like that mom guilt can kind of creep up too, you know? So I think that I don't feel it on like a regular basis necessarily, but I do have a lot of practice in, you know, and redirecting myself and being gentle with myself and knowing kind of the bigger picture as a therapist and how, you know, life is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's really easy to kind of start judging ourselves on these little micro moments that we have, like, oh, I shouldn't have yelled or I shouldn't have done that. And, you know, I can always remind myself, like, I can do better tomorrow. I can do better in the next 10 minutes. I can make a different choice. And practicing those skills of kind of talking to yourself in that kind, compassionate way is a great way to kind of cope with those, you know, those harsh critical feelings and of mom guilt, right. That can kind of come up. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of those specific tools, like um, even specific words that we can give people to say to themselves when they get in that cycle of guilt? Well, I think the biggest thing is just noticing it, right? You know, that's the first thing I always want to practice with people is that so often we just like are on autopilot and we don't even hear those critical like things that we're saying to ourselves. We just kind of like float through them and we start like feeling agitated and irritated and like bad about ourselves. And we're kind of like bubbling up like a little, you know, pot of water, but being able to kind of tune in and recognize when you're talking like that to yourself, when you are being critical of yourself is a great skill to have. And I think it's kind of like the foundation of making any sort of changes. You have to actually recognize that it's happening to begin with, you know? So noticing those kind of physical cues, those mental cues that are telling you like, I'm being hard on myself right now, like too hard on myself and listening to what that harsh critical voice is saying, like you could have done better. You're the worst. Like, you know, those little things and being tuning into those, those phrases or those thoughts that are kind of going through our mind. And being intentional about responding to them saying like, I don't have time for that. You know, like I can do better in the next 10 minutes. Kind of the things I was saying a little earlier that I remind myself of how would I talk to a friend who was saying that about herself or himself? You know, would I be like, yeah, you are the worst. No, (laughs) you would never say that. You would kind of, you would take it back. You'd be like, you know what? You're doing your best. You've had a hard week. You haven't been sleeping a lot. Like, what can we do to kind of, you know, help you feel a little bit more together? What, you know, do you need some time on X day to, you know, take so-and-so out for a solo day with mom, you know, being able to, you know, respond to those thoughts and kind of problem solve around them. Like, what do you need to feel better about that situation? Or what do you need to feel a little, you know, more connected to someone else or connected to your child and yourself? Yeah. I like that last comment because guilt can be instructive. Like if it is something that keeps cropping up and you keep feeling guilty about, well, then maybe you can analyze that and figure out, okay, well, how can I make sure that situation doesn't happen as much? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's something I've been kind of, you know, going through in my own personal transition to having three kids is that, 
you know, like I was saying, it's very easy when you have a newborn to kind of be so hyper fixated on like everything that comes with having a newborn. My two older children are older and I was feeling bad about kind of spending less time with them and like, you know, being critical of that, that they probably miss me because I miss them, you know, like in kind of like this new transition of our relationships and, you know, listening to that voice and being like, you know what, I think I need to take my oldest out for lunch one day and we'll go eat and together and do something special. And my daughter has started walking our dog with us every night or walking her dog with me and we leave the baby at home, you know, like that everyone kind of has a way of recalibrating. And like you said, problem solving and being able to look at the feelings that we're having as information and saying, well, what can I do to feel better about X or to kind of shift the feeling around it? And, you know, we can, when we're open to that and we're listening to that, those harsh critical feelings or those feelings of guilt, we can start problem solving. I like that. Uh, I have also been exploring the idea of maybe we identify things as guilt that aren't necessarily guilt. Like I was, Mm. I was thinking about specifically the situation of when, uh, mom has to go back to work after maternity leave. And I, mm-hmm. I definitely can see that there's some guilt around that. Like I should be with my baby kind of stuff. But I also think it's it's maybe stronger because we're also mixing that feeling of guilt with just plain old, I miss my kid. You know, like yeah. sometimes it's sadness and we're kind of mixing that sadness to compound our, I'm just making yeah. this up, but <laughs> no, I love that. No, I once read this article and it was talking about, you know, going back to work and that it was like a bouquet of emotions that they were carrying with them. It was kind of like um, confusion and exhaustion and fatigue and anger that they had to go back, but also kind of wanting to go back. And, you know, that there's this whole bouquet of carrying all of these things around. And we kind of, guilt is kind of like, I don't want to say an easy one to kind of take on because it's kind of like this cultural thing, mom guilt, right? That we hear about all the time. And sometimes that's easier than kind of sitting and dealing with that whole bouquet of emotions that might be coming up. And some of that might be relief. You know, I I don't know about anybody else, but when I had like postpartum depression, I felt relief to go back to work. You know, like I also felt guilty because I felt relief, you know, because I wanted that like to feel connected to myself and connected to kind of something I was really good at because I was not very good at being a new mom at that moment, right? Or at least I was still learning and that felt weird. So being able to kind of, I think like you said, identify all of those emotions that are coming up and not shy away from them is an important piece too. Yeah, that's so interesting that you bring up feeling feeling guilt at the relief because how awesome is that in such a term tumultuous time to feel some relief like mm-hmm. how, how kind would that be of ourselves to let us feel that good feeling of relief? Yeah. Like, yeah. awesome. I, I have a little break and I can come back refreshed and renewed instead of like, Oh, am I a terrible person that I don't want to be with my baby all the time? <laughs> if we, if more of us just acknowledge that whether you stay home, whether you work any time away, any breaks when you're so in the thick of it should allow you to feel relief and you should be able to enjoy and revel in that relief. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And I think that brings up, you know, the importance of like recognizing that bouquet of emotions, right. And being willing to look at them all, you know, instead of just being like blinders on, I don't want to see it all being able to say relief does feel good and the joy at the reunion and kind of being open to all of those good feelings and not just kind of fixating on the hard ones. Yeah. Poor relief. She doesn't get to be felt very much. (laughs) (laughs) No. Yeah. We try, we spend so much time trying and fixating on kind of these harder emotions, like knowing our triggers and knowing kind of what sets us off and knowing what makes us sad and really kind of like sitting in those heavy things. But there's also like those other emotions that are positive that are kind of intermixed in all of that and being able to identify those and kind of feel them. There's, there's power in that too, you know? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the other complication is just biology and, and when we are having postpartum depression or anxiety and stuff, how does that impact our guilt? And um, how do you recognize when it's regular old guilt or when it's something that you need to also take care of as far as postpartum depression or anxiety? 
Yeah, well, I think there's like, you know, they call postpartum depression like kind of the smiling depression, you know, because we're told as, you know, mothers that this is supposed to be a great time in our lives. It's supposed to be such a happy time. And, and it isn't necessarily for a lot of people for a variety of reasons. You know, I had postpartum depression and I'm a therapist and I don't think I didn't realize I had postpartum depression. I was having all these intrusive thoughts and I was like only eating peanut butter crackers. <laughs> like I, like in retrospect, I look back and I was like, oh my God, Bryce, like you were really depressed and you didn't even realize it. But I, there was an expectation on me to, you know, from a variety of, you know, societal ways. And I, my son was also in the NICU and, but he was like a big healthy baby in the NICU for being a preemie and there was like, you should be so grateful. Look at all these other little babies. And you know, that there is kind of this feeling that we have to kind of keep denying how we're really feeling. So we kind of play this role of like, I'm really happy. Like I'm smiling, even though kind of there's these other clues that are going on. But, you know, I think that being mindful and being willing to kind of look at ourselves in those moments and have our families be aware of the signs and symptoms of postpartum depression prior to us having children and having these conversations prior to childbirth. Um, So that it's not just us being on the lookout for these signs and symptoms that we have a support system that's able to kind of look at us, including our doctors, letting them know of any history of anxiety or depression in our past. Yeah. And just being, having these conversations, having people out in the open. And do you find that, um, Okay. The clients that you work with when they're in the throes of, of these things, uh, depression, anxiety, whatever it may be, do you find that the, the guilt spiral is, is even easier to succumb to? I do. Yeah. I mean, I think cause it all goes back to that inherent expectation that we should be happy. And so I think when it starts with something at that real basic level of like, I should be enjoying this, but I'm not, I mean, I think guilt is kind of the the one way we go, right? You know, that there is this kind of when there's the one thing that's expected of you doesn't feel good, right? And, you know, or isn't happening. How does that feel? It feels pretty awful. And I think that that kind of everything spirals down from there. Yeah. And there's so much anticipation leading up to it. When you're not feeling what you expected to feel, it's pretty shocking. Yeah. Or and what we've been told to feel, right? Yeah. Like that there is this, how many times, uh, you know, people wax philosophically about, you know, how, what a wonderful time this is. And it's the best time of your life. And all these platitudes that were kind of given both as pregnant people and, you know, in their newborn phase, um, you know, and when you're not feeling that it's, it's rough. You know, I remember walking down the road with my baby, my first baby who I had postpartum depression with, I didn't have postpartum with my other children, but my son cried 24 hours a day. He was a preemie. He was just mad that he was outside in the real world. And I remember walking down the road, like I would walk with him every day. Cause I just couldn't sit in my house with him screaming 24 seven. And this couple stopped me and they were you know, like, Oh, this is the best time, isn't it? I was like, yes, it's wonderful. I, I don't know. (laughs) And I just kind of like, like a zombie, like walked away, you know, because I was just like, wow, this, is this really what it's going to be like? How long is this going to be like this? And, you know, you start kind of going down this path of, you know, just what am I missing? What's wrong with me? You know, something must be wrong with me if this is what everyone else is experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. There's also such a thing as amnesia that we selected amnesia (laughs) that we have, isn't there? Like when we're, yeah, even me, like I'm six years out from that stage. I'm like, Oh yeah, that was so sweet. The cuddling and the wonderful. I had some rough babies, you know, like it was hard. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's the truth, right? You know, that there is this kind of like amnesia that we have, um, that kind of drives those, those statements. Right. But I also think, you know, my oldest is almost eight years old and, you know, I think we didn't, social media didn't exist like it does today. Right. Like it's kind of evolved differently. At least I wasn't a part of social media at that time. And there just wasn't this kind of community of people talking about this, you know, like now I think that there is so much more openness about these feelings kind of, 
we're not just getting the people walking by us at the grocery store or on the sidewalk telling us how wonderful it is. We're also hearing kind of another, you know, end of the spectrum. So I think there is kind of like a gift in that in a lot of ways that there is kind of more people recognizing the signs and symptoms early and more people talking about like the less, you know, positive <laughs> parts of becoming a parent. Yeah, I think I think social media has evolved in very positive ways toward reality and authenticity. <laughs> yeah, it's been an interesting thing. You know, I have kind of, you know, you can look at it from two ends of the spectrum. Like, I think that there is kind of like reality falls somewhere in the middle of what we see on social media. Like, I think we see like the really bad stuff and I think we see the really good stuff. And there's a world in the middle that probably is where most of us live. Um, but it is, it's, you know, I think especially in the maternal mental health field, you know, that there has been a lot of positive change in terms of showing different ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Well, and it, it also depends on what we've, what we've curated. Cause you, there's so much out there that you can kind of find what you're looking for as long as you're like selective about who you follow and how that affects you and all that stuff, there's yeah. not like this one social media, everybody has their own personal version of social media based on what you follow and how you yes. show up. Exactly. Right. Very true. You know, what you're kind of engaging with, what you're liking and what you're looking for. Right. Yeah. You know, we all like, you know, we all live in different places and in the social media world, you know, yeah. what we're seeing and what we're consuming and, and we have control over that. Yeah. Yeah. Which can be pretty empowering. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So let's, let's um, move on to the mommy wars. Like, have you personally felt judged or supported by other moms? Hmm. I think that's a great question. I have felt generally supported, you know, and I think that is a matter of kind of like who we choose to have in our space, right? You know, that we do have choices in that regard. Um, you know, I think that we do see it a lot in terms of like, I hear it a lot, I guess I should say, in terms of like the social media world that I'm a part of, right? This whole mommy wars thing. And I'm not sure how much of it feels like real to me all the time <laughs> you know like that yeah. it does kind of feel like some sort of you know like media driven like us against them um mentality that was maybe kind of like thrust upon us right and i'm not saying drama. that other people yeah for some drama of course we have to do that to like you know have women be you know against each other in some ways um you know i think i feel it you know i hear it in some ways you know in terms of um mostly in like lifestyle choices, you know, um, sleep training versus not sleep training and, you know, how we choose to feed our children and how we choose to, um, like choices we make about our kids, you know, like little things like that is where I feel like I see it the most. And I almost feel like I see it the most in, in kind of early motherhood, you know, that there are so many more choices and we're feeling so much less sure about the choices that we're making that it can feel very, we can feel very defensive about, the choices other people are making. And, you know, I think going back to that perspective piece, I think the further we get out from those early stages and that kind of early, that learning, um, you know, that there's, once we get far out from that kind of vulnerable early motherhood stage where we're, you know, being kind of in this learning, wanting to do our best job and also looking at what everybody else is doing, trying to figure out if, you know, are they doing it better? Or are they making better choices than me? And I think that that's where I see it the most, or I hear it the most in regards to like our social media world. That's where I've been seeing it the most, you know, is that kind of early motherhood time period when we're feeling that vulnerability and, you know, where there's so much more pressure on what we choose, you know, this or that. And that's when I hear about it the most in terms of like, my own little tiny world, but I feel like it comes up so much less, you know, at the age my kids are currently and whether that's because of my own, you know, who I've surrounded myself with or that people are starting to realize that like, we're all just doing our best and making the best choices we can and we're going with it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's been one, cause I, as I'm examining like how to end the mommy wars, that was one of my, one of the things I was going to talk about is just like, well, just grow up, like just, <laughs> just have some more experience and it will naturally go away. But, you know, I, I'll of course give tools for when you're in it, but, but that is kind of the most natural way to 
get over the mommy wars is just that kind of everybody does at a certain time in motherhood. Yeah. Once they realize either they have more children that, and they realize, oh, there is no right answer because the right answer for one is different than the other, or, mm-hmm. or they just realize how hard it is and give other mothers grace. And so they're not <laughs> right imposing that. I mean, I think most moms just kind of do grow out of it, but you know, there are those, there are those who don't. And if we can help people reach that stage earlier, so much the better. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of that can go back to just like how we talk to ourselves, being able to remind ourselves that, you know, I'm feeling this way because I feel vulnerable. I'm feeling like very judgmental of this other person because I'm feeling vulnerable about my own choices and unsure about my own choices. And it's not necessarily about them. You know, what what we're thinking and when we're feeling that kind of judgmental inclination, it can be very easy to kind of like just want to project it out further but really kind of taking it back to yourself and be like, well, why am I feeling like that? Why am I feeling kind of competitive or judgmental? And what is that saying about kind of me and my feelings about my own choices and, you know, where I'm at in my own life? Yeah. Which is hard to do. It is hard to do. And especially like, I think we also, because of that amnesia, we can forget how, how big everything seemed like you talked about earlier in that, in those early years and how, how it seems like it's really going to matter what kind of sippy cup you buy or, you know? Yeah. Every, every decision we make feels so impactful and weighted and heavy. And I think that that is a big part of that kind of like heaviness and you know, overwhelm we feel in early motherhood. And, you know, I think that being able to have some perspective and distance from that, like you said, that like, I can do a million different things with a million different kids and everyone's going to be different because yeah. they're unique human beings. And we're just, you know, trying to figure them out until they can figure themselves out and we'll go from there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can't forget also that it might also be a impacted by the extreme sleep deprivation you're in then like Mm -hmm. you that that intensifies every every feeling yeah exactly just that kind of your world is kind of thrown up in a loop and it just it exacerbates all of our vulnerabilities yeah yeah it's so it's so fascinating and I I hope that at least you know some people who are in those early stages can listen to this episode and get some perspective and just some relief, you know? (laughs) I agree. Yeah. And I think being mindful of kind of the messaging that we're getting that kind of exacerbates those feelings, you know, I think all the time that there's so much messaging right now in terms of the parenting world of that there is a right way to handle things. There's a right sippy cup. You know, these are the five best cups recommended by <laughs> so-and-so, right? And it kind of gives us that feeling like that. I don't want to say like anxiety or, but you know, that's this feeling that there is a right choice to make and how I have to find that right choice. When, like you were saying earlier, like there isn't necessarily a right choice. There is like trying a few different things and seeing like this works best for now. And then this one might work best. And kind of getting some flexibility and perspective around, you know, the choices that we are making and how that impacts how we view what choices other people are making, because they are all so unique and in, in motion. Yes. It's like the most experimental field out there, motherhood. It really is, isn't it? It's kind of like being a little like scientist all the time, right? You know, like if I put them down at 715, will they sleep better than if they went down at 730? And if we use this cup, how will they feel and what this bottle does? And, you know, it's always kind of just trying to figure it out and do your best and put less weight into each and every single choice that you make. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I just wish I had a magic wand to wave that feeling away for all those new mothers. <laughs> Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice, right. To kind of have the wisdom of experience right when you're first getting started, but that's part of the learning process. Right. I mean, we, you know, we can't do that for our kids either. Right. We kind of have to let them kind of go through it and, you know, encourage them in terms of, you know, our own perspective and do the best we can, I guess. Yeah. And I, I think, I think we, 
that's important for us who have more experience to remember because we've, I mean, we've been there. The most annoying thing is when all these older moms are just either dismissing your, your worries about mm-hmm. some of these decisions or, or just constantly giving advice, you know? So it, yeah. although you want to, you want to help those moms get to where you are. It, it's hard to know how to go about that without being either obnoxious or dismissive. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a fine balance, you know, and I think some of that is just really kind of bolstering that internal intuition that people have, right. Saying like, you're going to make the greatest, the best choice you have, you know, instead of saying like necessarily you're going to, my baby did this and your baby would probably like blank or, you know, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal, you know, but really like honoring that, like they are capable of making good choices and that they will make the best choices that they can for themselves and their kids. And, you know, that there is a lot of internal wisdom that they already have inside of them. Thank you so much for listening to the How She Moms podcast and for being part of this community. There are so many other ways for you to connect and hopefully also contribute. I share tips and ideas regularly on Instagram and Facebook at How She Moms. You can find past episodes and other resources at HowSheMoms.com. And you can always just email me directly at Whitney at HowSheMoms.com. Special thanks to my own wonderful mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.